Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam as we greet you on this the 16th day of the month of uh, Jumadi al-Ula. So that means we have Jumadi al-Akhirah, we have Rajab and Shaban, three and a half months left before blessed Ramadan. We greet you Allah and uh, greet you all on this the 16th day of Jumadi al-Ula uh, from the studios of the Islamic Broadcasting Network here in my native island of Trinidad with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We are making an effort to a live stream uh, and live streaming is on IBN TV on Facebook. IBN TV on Facebook. Don't ask me what is Facebook. I don't know what is Facebook. <coughs> Please excuse me. I have been ill for the last three weeks um, and now I still have the cough. So I may be coughing during the session, so kindly excuse me. Uh, we begin with announcements. And the first one, happily so, that uh, for the first time in 12 years, uh, I am now conducting a class uh, in Trinidad. I, the last time was uh, I conducted a class on Suratul Kaf. Uh, Suratul Kaf, yes, that was in 2019. Uh, uh, 2006, so 14 years, 14 years, uh, 2006. Um, uh, the class is, go is being held at the Jama Masjid in San Fernando. Uh, it's on Wednesdays at Maghrib time. And I am teaching, first of all, the Quran and the Moon methodology for recitation of the Quran, it's a fascinating subject. I wish someone had taught this to me when I was a teenager. So bring your teenage sons and daughters, yes, bring them to the class and let them learn the Quran and the moon methodology for recitation of the Quran. I can completed perhaps in about three or four sessions. And then we turn to the Quran and the stars, which is also extremely fascinating methodology for study of the Quran. Um, do please bring a notebook and bring your copy of the Quran with you. Uh, let me remind you, it's every Wednesday at Maghrib time at the Jama Masjid in San Fernando. Uh, I don't know when I'll ever be able to take another class. I don't know if this is going to be the la last one ever. So I look forward to seeing you all, particularly if you belong to any of the villages and towns around San Fernando. Uh, do please come on Wednesdays at Maghrib time, and I'll be very happy to welcome you, inshallah. Uh, the next announcement is that we are scheduling a special session at this IBN, uh, IBN Sunday morning session. We are scheduling a special session for, for sisters. We are going to invite certain sisters to come uh, to be here with me at the studio um, so that the voices of women can be heard, our sisters. Uh, on issues for affecting families, issues affecting children. This is an age of universal collapse all around the world. Society is collapsing. So there must be issues here in Trinidad and Tobago. And we want to hear our sisters speaking about these issues affecting families, affecting children, affecting women, and of course, also issues facing the Muslim community. The one sister I would dearly love to have, uh, I went to visit her, she was ill, she was on her bed, uh, is our sister Anissa Abu Bakr. If you hear this, 
if you hear this program and he says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh to you, I wish you could come if you are well enough. So this will be on, uh, on February the 16th. And uh, not only those women who are going to be participating with me in the discussion session, but other sisters as well, you are welcome to come. And we try to put some chairs over here in the studio. And you can come and you can listen and maybe you can also ask some questions and so on. So sisters, do take a note. Here's your chance on February the 16th, a special session devoted to sisters on issues facing us in this last age, Akhir Zaman, the signs of the time. If you want to come to attend, then do please try to reach here by about 8 o'clock in the morning. <coughs> we have another announcement now, and again, it's a happy, a happy announcement for me to make. And that is, alhamdulillah, my shipment of books has arrived. I now have a complete collection of all my books, except two which are out of print. And... Uh, I have found that while my books go on sale in other parts of the world, here in Trinidad, people uh, don't seem to recognize the importance of having a library of books at home. Remember, my father was a school principal, and he didn't get married until he was age 40, and he used to spend his money buying books. And I was only 12 years of age. My father died when I was 15 without knowing that I used to be in his library. And he had an excellent collection of books in his library, imported from Britain, books on Islam. And I was reading books on Islamic philosophy. Of course, I really didn't understand much about it. But then there were also books on Islamic history, for example. And they fired off my imagination. I, I devoured those books at the age of 12 and 13 and 14. And it had a tremendous impact upon me and my scholarship. So it makes sense to have a good collection of books at your home. And your children can grow up reading those books. So I, I'm going to do this very quickly now because we don't have much time. Uh, here is the importance of the prohibition of riba in Islam. It was published about 20, more than 20 years ago. But I've now brought out a new edition now, a new, uh, a new uh, cover design um, on this very important subject. This one is Dajjal, the Quran, and Awal Zaman. It represents my first book on Dajjal, one of the most difficult subjects you can find, and yet one of the most important. And very few people, very few scholars are devoting attention to this subject. Dajjal, the Quran, and Awal zaman is now available. Here is my second book on Dajjal, just written. This is a new book. Dajjal, uh, the Quran, Dajjal, and the Jasad. And you'd be surprised to find the references in the Quran uh, to Dajjal. This is a very illuminating book, perhaps the first of its kind ever written. And uh, this book is now available. Here is another one just written, Constantinople in the Quran. That one of the major prophecies of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam is that after the Great War, which is now coming, the nuclear war, he says the next event after that would be the conquest of Constantinople. And perhaps again, this is the first time anybody has written a book on the subject, Constantinople in the Quran. This one is a book Surah Al-Kaf, uh, explanation and commentary, uh, which was written several years ago, but now I brought out a new edition, and I've updated some of the comments that I've made on this tafsir of Surah Al-Kaf. Here is one of my recent books, Methodology for Study of the Quran, and uh, particularly if you're coming to attend my my, my sessions at San Fernando Jama Masjid, or if, if you're coming to, I have, a, I have a, a session on this subject at another location, uh, but I'm not going to mention it publicly, but you know if you're listening. Uh, if you're coming to attend that session, of course, then this is a book that you must get. Methodology for Study of the Quran. 
I have to write the book on methodology for the recitation of the Quran. Uh, that book is almost finished now, but I'm still working on it, inshallah. Here's another recent book. Um, the Quran, the Great War, and the West. We have a Great War which is coming. Our prophet has prophesied it. He called it the Malhama. But in Christian and Jewish eschatology, it is called Armageddon. And you'd want to know what does Islam say about this great war. So here is a small book devoted to this subject, which, which, in which I am anticipating that that great war is going to result in the destruction of modern Western civilization, that after that great war, the West will have to play nothing more than a peripheral role, a peripheral role in world affairs. Here is a very interesting book, um, <coughs> which you enjoy reading. It is entitled, The Strategic Importance of Dreams and the Visions in Islam. This is a forgotten branch of knowledge, um, and it's very rare to find today someone who has been blessed by Allah with the capacity to interpret dreams and visions. I don't have that knowledge, no, but I do know what is the importance of the subject. And here is a book which is devoted to that subject, The Strategic Importance of Dreams and Visions in Islam. This is a small book uh, written uh, six years ago about Khidr alayhi salam, the scholar of Akhir zaman the alim, the scholar, the sheikh who is able to preach, to teach, and to explain the reality of the world in Akhir zaman is not your normal product of the Darul Uloom. No, no, they can't do it. He has to be a Khidr, alayhi salam. And this book is devoted to Khidr and how to find someone who is walking in his footsteps. A beautiful little book. You can read it in one hour. Here's another small one written about 10, 10 years or 12 years ago, perhaps, Medina returns to center stage in Akhir uh, Zaman, that yes, before, before um, the Malhama, yes, Medina has no role to play. But, but after that, Marina, Medina is going to return to center stage because Dajjal will not be able to enter Mecca and Medina. Dajjal and plague. This book, George Bernard Shaw and the Islamic scholar, is a, re is a recording of a conversation conducted between these two great men. Uh, the meeting took place in Mombasa in 1935. And last September, I was blessed to visit Mombasa myself for the first time ever. And I was thrilled thrilled to go to a Mombasa that Maulana Abdul Alim Siddiqui had visited so many times and where this conversation took place with George Bernard Shaw. The conversation was recorded. It was published in Sri Lanka in 1935. Maulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari published it, Rahimahullah published it in Pakistan in 1952. And then in the year 2000, while I was in San Francisco, on the west coast of the United States. I had a few days free, and I wrote a commentary on this conversation, and here you are. This is an old book of mine, uh, which we have only a few copies left. It's soon going to be out of print. Uh, so those of you who buy complete sets can still get a, few co um, a, a copy of this. The Religion of Abraham and the State of Israel, the reason why it has not been reprinted is because I want to bring out a new edition of this book. But this has a lot of research work in it. The religion of Abraham and the state of Israel, a view from the Quran. This one is on fasting and power. The Ramadan comes and Ramadan goes. And as they say in French, plus ça change, plus la même chose. There's no difference. There's no difference. The community remains the same. But no, Allah has sent the fast of Ramadan to have an impact upon the entire community. 
and to deliver power to the community. Power is not only external, power is also internal. And fasting is meant to deliver internal power. This one explains Israel's mysterious imperial agenda. That uh, first of all, Allah speaks in the Quran in Surah Fussilat uh, about, uh, is it Fussilat? Mursalat, sorry, uh, about a shadow. A shadow which will come upon the world and will come upon the world in three parts. In Taliko ila zillin zi salasi shu'ab. And I have interpreted that shadow of the three parts to be Pax Britannica, Pax Americana, and then there's something to come after the Great War, which is Pax Judaica, and that explains Israel's mysterious agenda. Israel wants to rule the world so that Dajjal could stand up in Jerusalem and declare, I am the Messiah. This is a book. I conducted this research when I was doing my PhD in Geneva, and I was able to, to access the UN, the United Nations Library in Geneva, and I uh, got the research material done there. Um, the Caliphate, the Hejaz, and the Saudi Wahhabi nation state. If we are to restore the Khilafah state, we must know something about the history of the Khilafah state, and in particular how the last remnant of it was destroyed in the First World War, and then by Mustafa Kemal, the abolition of the Khilafah. This one is on Gog and Magog. It was written about uh, nine, ten years ago. Um, an Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world, it is something mysterious to me that our brothers, the scholars of Islam, uh, they seem to avoid the Quran when they come to study this subject. They simply go to one hadith and conclude, oh, no, 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 Gog and Magog will only come after Jesus' return, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Nikid Dajjal. Full stop, that's it. Go back home now, eat your biryani and go to sleep. <laughs> but when you go to the Quran to study the subject, you realize that, no, well, Gog and Magog are those who brought the Jews back to the Holy Land, brought back to Jerusalem to reclaim it as their own after 2,000 years of exile. Gog and Magog are those who spread out all over the world with their indestructible power, with wars of imperialism, and took control of power in the world, and in the process corrupted, corrupted and destroyed all the institutions in the world, so that all of mankind will now follow their way of life, which is an essentially godless and corrupt way of life. The Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world. Here's my small book written immediately after the uh, um, uh, attack on America on 9-11. I was there in New York. I was there in New York uh, on uh, the, nine, the 11th of September 2001. In fact, that very morning I went to Kennedy Airport at 7 in the morning. And then after Kennedy, I had to go to LaGuardia Airport. And when I reached the LaGuardia Airport, the airport was closed. Sorry, all flights were suspended. And while I was sitting in the airport, the announcement was made the airport was closed. When I got back home in Queens and I saw on the television screen that there was the attack on America. And this little book represents my response to that Muslim a Muslim response to the attack on America, I always knew it was a lie. There are three kinds of lies. There are normal lies, there are great lies, and then there are 9-11. I knew it was a lie. They attacked America, and then they put the blame on us. Here is my first book, Maulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah. He ordered me to write this book, Islam and Buddhism in the Modern World. I was just 29 years of age when this book was written, and it represents my youth, the scholarship of my youth. It still remains one of the only books on the subject. Here is Surah Tulkaf and the Modern Age. Surah Tulkaf is the Surah par excellence of Akhirul Zaman. And in Surah Tulkaf, there are four main stories. 
there is uh, the young man in the cave, there is the poor man and the rich man in the garden, there is uh, Musa alayhi salam and his encounter with Khidr alayhi salam, and then there is Zulkarnain, the great traveler. And in this book, we have devoted attention to all four of those. In addition, there is a very important chapter in this book on the Quran and time. And I'm now expanding on that subject of Quran and time with knowledge I did not have when I wrote this book. In my class, that is being conducted at Jama Masjid San Fernando on Wednesday nights. One class has taken place already. Um, and we have the second class coming up this Wednesday. Do please come uh, to attend that class. Here is a book which is particularly important today in this age of uh, alcoholism and drug addiction. Uh, the Quranic Method of Curing Alcoholism and Drug Addiction. Um, and it explains Allah's method, the stage and sta stage by stage method by which you can cure yourself from an addiction. This is not the only addiction that people have. People have other addictions as well. Like the modern, the leaders of all the modern West, they have an addiction in telling lies, great lies, yeah. So here is a book that's important for the world today. Um, this is an old book on not only Ramadan, but Isra and Miraj, the, the strategic significance of Isra and Miraj, which was a fascinating event in the life of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Here is a, we still have a few more books left. Iqbal and Pakistan's Moment of Truth. This is a very important subject for us to be able to understand the world after the abolition of the Khilafah. How the new world came into being which is no longer Darul Islam. It is rather a copycat of the modern concept of a state which came from modern God bless Western civilization. And what role has Iqbal played? Uh, may Allah forgive him. He's a great scholar. He's a teacher of my teacher. I have great admiration for him. But when you made a mistake, we have a duty to point out your mistake. And Iqbal did make a mistake here in uh, accepting that the modern Republican state, which came out of, U of Europe, could be an adequate substitute for the Khilafah, and that is false. And this book exposes that subject. Here's how the Muslim community should be organized until the Khilafah can be restored. We must organize ourselves as a jama'ah. Ah. The jama'ah Ah must be, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> The Jama'ah must be led by an Amir. The members of the Jama'ah must pledge to obey the Amir. And when you give your word, you must keep your word. You must listen and you obey. And the Amir has a duty to now enforce the Deen on the members of the Jama'ah to the extent that it is possible to enforce it in the modern secular state. One Jama'ah, one Amir. This book is on money. The gold dinar and silver dirham, Islam and the future of money. If we were a people who used to think, and if we had been studying the Quran, which we've not been doing, we would have known that money in the Quran is the gold dinar and the silver dirham. That money has intrinsic value. And so we were all asleep or, or eating biryani and going home when, when our enemies came and took dinar and dirham out of the market and replaced it with bogus and fraudulent paper money and then changed it from paper to electronic money and then from electronic money to another sub, sub money called cryptocurrencies until finally there's no money at all except invisible and intangible money. And then finally uh, the world will be ruled by one central bank in Israel. This is where we are heading. But our people are, are fast asleep. And the gold dinar and silver dirham, Islam, and the future money is meant to wake us up to what is the reality of money in the modern world. This is a, a nice book to read. It takes so much time to write it. The story of my travels, 
Uh, these, are, these are the travels I conducted in 2007 to 2008. And uh, they make fascinating reading. It's though you traveling with me. And there are many who are asking me, why don't you write another travelogue? The problem is there are more important books to write. And while, yes, I love to write a travelogue, it takes time to write it. I don't have the time. Um, this is the first travelogue. This is 2002, 2003. And that is the, one, the second travelogue. So there are two I have there. Here is a collection of my essays on the subjects pertaining to the modern age, the signs of the last day in the modern age. Here is uh, my bestseller, the book which I wrote 20 years ago and which still remains a bestseller to this day, Jerusalem in the Quran, an Islamic view of the destiny of Jerusalem. Uh, I wish I could bring out another edition of this book, but I don't have the time to do it. Um, but uh, here is my bestseller. And uh, finally, thank Allah, we this the last one now. This is my teacher, Maulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah, The Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society, in two volumes, two volumes, massive books, yeah. Um, and uh, very nicely printed, beautifully with a, with a box, uh, case. And uh, all of these books are now available. Uh, if you are abroad, just send me an email. You'll find my email address at the bottom of the screen. Uh, just send me an email if you would like to order a complete set of books. And I will send you an invoice. Uh, please put my email address at the bottom of the screen, Siddiq. Um, there you are, that's my email address. And uh, if you're in Trinidad and you like to order books, uh, you can also call me on the phone. Only if you're in Trinidad. If you're abroad, please don't call me on the phone. Uh, you get my phone number at the bottom of the screen. Um, call me on the phone or you can come to my class. Um, Sadiq, just please my, put my number at the bottom of the screen. Um, and uh, you can order uh, the complete set of my books, autograph. So these are the announcements for, uh, for today. Um, oh no, one more announcement, and that is that uh, inshallah, ex after Eid ul Fitr, I hope to travel again, even at this old age now, I'm still traveling. Um, and after Eid, immediately after Eid, the first weekend, I will lecture in London on that important subject of Kashmir, the way forward, and then travel to Malaysia and then to Indonesia. We have a very important lecture in Bandung on the Quran and the way forward for the world of Islam. And then hopefully my first visit to Philippines and my first visit to China. And then if you're in Australia, we're planning now for my third visit to Australia and then to Mauritius for a few days and South Africa, Cape Town, Durban and Pretoria, and then back to Mombasa for a short visit, not long, and then back to Britain, inshallah. So this is uh, uh, my travels, inshallah, after Eid al-Fitr. I want to turn now to uh, another major event which occurred while I was ill and could not come to IBN. And that is a commendable effort made by, uh, gen by, um, by Prime Minister Dr. Mohammed Mahathir of Malaysia recently in convening a, an Islamic summit conference in Kuala Lumpur. He knew that it was a waste of time to have it convened in Jeddah because it would be under the control of the Saudis and no one could speak unless the Saudis approved. So he, uh, he, uh, he convened it in Kuala Lumpur. And of course, the Saudis then got very angry because they want to have control over the world of Islam. And the organization of Islamic cooperation exists with its headquarters in Jeddah. It used to be called l'Organisation de la Conférence Islamique, the Organization 
of the Islamic conference. That's a French title translated to English. But it was a very awkward title in English. So they changed it now to the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. And this organization has headquarters in Jeddah. And now when Dr. Mahathir called for this summit in Kuala Lumpur, this is the first time mm -hmm. since 1969, first time, that this body was challenged. This body has remained since the fire took place in Masjid Al-Aqsa in 1969, in August 1969. And then a summit conference was held in Rabat in September 1969. And uh, then the organization emerged as the organization of the Islamic conference. And from 1969 until 1973, it remained a paper organization. But then when the war took place in 1973, an opportunity occurred. An opportunity presented itself, and it was the political genius of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who joined forces with King Faisal Rahimahullah of Saudi Arabia to pull off the Lahore Islamic Summit Conference. That Lahore Islamic Summit Conference of the OIC was, was the one attempt that was made to make the organization strong and give it some teeth. If they had succeeded, the OIC could have been a powerful organization, but they struck one year later and they assassinated King Faisal, Rahimahullah. And then two years later, I think, or three years later, Bhutto was assassinated. And that was the end of that. So the organization remained a paper organization all these years, from 1974, the Lahore Islamic Conference, Summit Conference until uh, two, three weeks ago, when Dr. Mahathir made the first effort now, since then, to bring together the world of Islam in Kuala Lumpur. Dr. Mahathir is about 92, 93 years of age now. He's unlikely to live for much longer. And this was a commendable effort on his part. And in this Summit Conference, one of the important things that they called for was to strengthen our capacity to resist sanctions because that's what they do. Anytime you step out of line, they impose sanctions on you. So Dr. Mahathir called upon the summit to return to the gold dinar and silver dirham for trade between the Muslim countries in order to be able to get around the sanctions being imposed by the West on those who are on stepping out of line with the West. Uh, Turkey attended the conference, um, Erdogan, the president. Iran attended the conference, uh, Rouhani, President Rouhani. The Amir of Qatar also attended the conference. They were the high profile. But out of some 50-something, 50 52 uh, member states of the OIC, only about 20 of them came to Kuala Lumpur. Uh, the, the most important one who stayed away, of course, was Pakistan. Uh, Dr. Mahathir had traveled to Pakistan. I have just a few minutes left. Dr. Mahathir traveled to Pakistan and met with Imran Khan. And Pakistan was part of the organizing committee that organized the conference and was committed to the conference. And Imran Khan would have gone to the conference. But... The Saudis put their feet down. Pakistan is a client state of the United States, of, 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 United, of Saudi Arabia. Pakistan does not have the freedom. If Saudi Arabia says no, it's no. That's the unfortunate situation today. So the Pakistanis got pressure from Saudis to stay away from that conference. And at the last minute, at the very last minute, Pakistan had to succumb and take a decision not to attend the conference. It is rather, it is rather um, <coughs> um, sad, really, uh, that we are told that the Pakistanis perhaps may appear to have made a deal with the Saudis. Well, OK, we'll stay away on the condition that you call a foreign minister's conference of the OIC to discuss Kashmir. Well, that's not the way. That's not the ethical way 
You don't make deals like this, no. That's not the way Muslims behave. And the Saudi, Saudis perhaps have agreed to it, but it's not going to take Pakistan anyway. That's not the road to, to travel on. The, tr the road to travel on is the road of truth, not of deals. And uh, the Saudis, therefore, have succeeded in um, boycotting that conference, and so many states stayed away. Uh, this is a, a sad indication of the negative role being played by Saudi Arabia. Uh, what is the implication for us now of this effort which is made by Dr. Mahathir in Saudi Arabia? In the few minutes which now remain, my message has to be directed to Pakistan and to the people of Pakistan. And that is that the Saudi connection is not good for Pakistan. That Pakistanis have to understand that Saudi Arabia is a client state of the United States of America. That the Saudis dance to the American tune and the Americans dance to the Saudi tune. They're dancing with each other. And uh, Pakistan has made it clear we're moving away from the United States now. We're not going to fight for American wars anymore. The next step for, Saudi, for Pakistan is to move away from its client state with, with Saudi Arabia. And this, the, the government in Islamabad can't do that. They're powerless. So it is the people who must now launch an effort in Pakistan, a peaceful process all over the country with the Islamic movement participating in that protest to get the Pakistani government to, to, to get out of that client-state relationship with Saudi Arabia. That there could be, for example, a referendum on the subject. And the Pakistani government is eventually forced to allow a public referendum. And once the referendum takes place and the people vote uh, to, to, to sever this client-state relationship with Saudi Arabia, the Pakistani government will then have no option. At this time, they are in a state where they cannot do anything. But if the people force it upon them, then the government can take steps to get out of this client-state relationship with Saudi Arabia and then join with the efforts of men like Dr. Mahathir in Kuala Lumpur to try to give to the world of Islam more freedom to be able to work, to build a, a more powerful world of Islam in the future. We end uh, by reminding you uh, about my complete set of books, which are now available in Trinidad. Um, there's a number at the bottom of the screen. You can call me if you'd like to order a complete set. I will let you know the price. And uh, if you are abroad, uh, they send me an email. There's an email at the bottom of the screen that you'd like to order a complete set of the books autographed. And then we'll send you an invoice, and then we'll ship the books to you. Uh, and finally, uh, I look forward to seeing you at my class at the Jama Masjid San Fernando uh, on Wednesday at the time of Maghrib. Uh, we are teaching the Quran and the Moon, methodology for study, methodology for recitation of the Quran, and the Quran and the stars, methodology for study of the Quran. Do please bring your <laughs> notebook and bring your copy of the Quran. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.